tonight, I'm going to talk to you about how we must lead with our head and our heart if we want former foster youth to be successful. I have six-year-old twin daughters, and they have a pretty good idea of what it is that I do for work. And one day they said, Daddy, have you ever helped Annie? Annie was in foster care, right? I paused, thought about who they were talking about, and said, no, I've never helped Annie. But I have lot, helped lots of other kids. Oh, yeah, they said. What were their names? I was impressed that my kids could make the connection between Annie and the young people we serve at First Place for Youth, the organization that I lead. As I reflected a little longer, I realized that what most of the world thinks of foster youth is what happens to little orphan Annie. The original idea was that a family with enough love in his heart and enough room in his house would bring in a child, treat that child as their own, and stick with them through thick or thin. 50% of kids who are put into foster care will be placed with a permanent family. And most of those kids will do okay. The kids I work with, they represent the other 50%, those who do not find a permanent place to call home. When Noel Anaya, a current first place participant, was one year old, he and his five brothers and sisters were put into foster care. Today, he is 21. In California, that is when young people age out. This process becomes official at a final court hearing, and Noel got rare permission to record his proceedings. Walking into court for my very last time as a foster youth, I feel like I'm getting a divorce from a system that I've been in a relationship with almost my entire life. It's bittersweet because I'm losing guaranteed money for food and housing, as well as access to my social workers and lawyer. But on the other hand, I'm relieved to finally get away from a system that ultimately failed me on its biggest promise, that one day, it would find me a family who would love me. Good afternoon, let's go on the record. This is line six, the matter of Noel Anaya. Noel. Noel Anaya, thank you. You guys been saying it wrong for 21 years? You know what? <laughs> Everybody pronounces it differently. So um, thank you though, I'm, I'm glad to know it's Noel. Little it's things, eight, like when my judge, Shauna Schwartz, mispronounces my name, serve as a constant reminder that, hey, I'm just a number. I often come away feeling powerless and anonymous in the foster care system. It is important to note that foster care is largely a manifestation of poverty. 85% of kids who are placed in foster care are placed there because of something called general neglect. Not abuse, but neglect which is another way of saying there isn't enough food, there aren't enough clothes, kids are being left home alone because mom and dad are working. We must remember, it is not that foster youth don't have families, it is that their families don't have the means to take care of them. And whether or not you believe that is because of decision making or circumstance, one thing I think we all can agree on is that children don't choose their parents. The typical young person that comes into first place for youth was put into foster care at the age of 11. He or she has been moved in and out of six different foster care placements or group homes and been forced to change schools at least three times. This level of chaos comes at a price in a kid's life. In 2016, one third of the young people coming through our doors did not have a high school diploma or a GED. A third of them had kids of their own. Over half had experienced homelessness or been arrested. Two thirds were unemployed. Now, I know you're looking at me and you're saying, yeah, but this guy's from Oakland. Those are Oakland problems. But the national data tells a pretty similar story. Data aside, the biggest thing that these young people have in common and the most influential factor in their lives 
is that they have lost their family as a core asset. I ask you to think for just a moment how your life might have turned out differently if we removed your family from the picture. Would the expectations that you had for yourself have gotten bigger or smaller? Would you be here today, sitting in this auditorium, listening to me talk? Or would you be somewhere else entirely different? I didn't grow up in foster care, but my life does bear some similarities to the young people we serve. I grew up in Indianola, Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta. For those of you who don't know, Mississippi is one of the poorest states in the country. The Delta is one of the poorest parts of Mississippi. And where my family and I are from, where we're from the poorest county in the Delta. My mother and father were 15 and 17 when they had me, and more like my big brother and sister than my parents. In my early 20s, a little bit older than the young people we serve, I moved out west. My family and I had a falling out, and suddenly, I was on my own. I was enrolled in community college, but the money I scrounged together from doing temporary work cleaning gutters and working at the parks department was not enough to pay the rent. For the first year and a half that I was in school, I was homeless. I slept in my car and crashed with friends when I could. During this time in my life, I don't remember feeling afraid. What I do remember was thinking, even though I was homeless, I was probably in much better shape than I had been in the last five or six years. Mainly because I could see where my future was going. I was finally working on something that was meaningful to me, a college degree. Back in my hometown, the best job that I could get, degree or no degree, was making $13,000 a year slinging 50-pound bags of potatoes at the Super Value Grocery Factory. It was hard work. It was respectable work. But it wasn't the life that I wanted. If we're going to empower former foster youth to beat the odds, we must not continue to just give them enough to get by. That is not how we break the cycle of poverty for these kids. That is not how we motivate them to achieve their full potential. So, what do we do? Well, first, you have to know what you're doing works. When I started at First Place for Youth as CEO in 2005, I asked the team, how do you know that you're being successful with the young people that you're working with? The answer I got was, well, because when kids come back, they give us hugs. Now, don't get me wrong, I like hugs. But I wasn't about to pin our young people's success on hugs alone. It wasn't just that I needed to get people to collect data. I needed to get them to care about it. We created mantras like, if you're not documenting it, you're not doing it. It was a cultural shift at the deepest level. I had people come to me and say, I didn't go to school to collect data. I went to school to work with kids. During this very tough transformation, we experienced almost 70% staff turnover. We went from using hardly any data in our work to becoming one of the most data-driven organizations in the country. If you were to ever visit First Place, my office is on the first floor, but the decisions are made upstairs in the data room. Because of this shift, we understand that if a young person goes to 10 group sessions, that that's a turning point. If we keep them in program for 13 months, we're going to get a key outcome for them, a place to live, a job, a degree. If we want that outcome to stick, we need to keep them in program for at least 18 months. But I'm also here to tell you that data alone 
will not change lives. Over the last 10 years, the social sector has been hyper-focused on trying to find a perfect algorithm for success. But just like having that recipe doesn't mean that the dish you're cooking is going to turn out right, following a program model doesn't guarantee success either. I know, I've been trying to make my grandmother's famous sweet potato pie for the last 20 years. <laughs> Trust is not transactional. And our young people have been given plenty of reasons not to trust anyone. Building authentic relationships with them takes time. The second thing that we've learned is that sometimes before you can hold someone accountable, you must first hold them. We do not give up on kids who don't meet our outcomes or our expectations. We stick with them. When that young person on our team has been working really hard for the last nine months and finally lands her first job, only to come into your office three weeks later and tell you she quit, being in a real relationship means that you're allowed to get frustrated with them. But just like family, you're not allowed to give up. You take a step back, you redefine the goals, you define the work and the sacrifice required to hit them. Because for every day that a young person takes a step back, there's another day when you find out a young man like Richard has been catching the bus two and a half hours early to make sure that he gets to his college courses on time. We must meet kids where they're at, but have the expectation that they will not remain there in the heart, in the tenacity to see them through. The third thing we have learned is that we must feel the cracks in the system. Direct services alone are not the answer. We must advocate for widespread policy changes so that our young people can achieve success at scale. Policies, even the ones created with the best of intentions, can sometimes serve as trap doors that people fall through versus bridges across troubled time. When I was homeless, standing in line to get food stamps was one of the hardest most embarrassing things that I've ever had to do. At that time, they told me, in order to receive that benefit, that I needed to quit college. But I knew that, the be that education was the best shot I had at never being in that line again. I was outraged, and I wouldn't be standing here today if I had to quit school. When I worked in San Francisco with homeless youth, kids straight out of the foster care system would show up at the shelter with all of their worldly possessions packed away in plastic bags. There was a bunch of press about it. So new funding came down to buy them sturdier luggage. Are you kidding me? They didn't need better luggage. They needed a better plan. It is incumbent upon those doing this work and those funding this work that we give kids what it is that they really need to succeed. We have to help them see around corners and avoid those trap doors. Today, the system plans six months to a year in advance of a young person's eventual exit from foster care. The number of young people transitioning from foster care directly into homelessness has decreased by more than 20%. But what has not changed is the number of former foster youth 
living above the poverty level and the number of them earning a living wage. College graduation rates are the same as they were 10 to 15 years ago. We have a long way to go. There are more than a half a million children in foster care in our country. This year, on the eve of their 18th birthday, 25,000 of them will pack their bags, and most of them will be put out into the world to navigate it on their own. It is not that former foster youth can't be successful. It is that the journey is just much harder. I believe that we can help every single one of them. We must empower them with direct services. We must advocate for systems change. We must measure our impact and be courageous enough to apply the data that we find. But we also must listen to the stories within the data. We must connect. This work takes both head and heart. My kids, they were on to something. They wanted the names of the young people that we had helped. When Noel and Aya started as an intern at first place, we put him at the front desk. There are two doors that you can enter into our offices from. Everyone always used his, including me. And I guarantee you, Noel knew everyone's name. Thank you. <laughs>